Welcome back to Psychedelics Today. This is Joe Moore coming at you from Breckenridge, Colorado, and we are also joined by... Kyle Buller. How's it going, everybody? (laughs) Great. So today on the show, we want to talk about ketamine. But before we get into that, let's do a little bit of an intro. Um, So Kyle and I have (laughs) uh, kind of soft launched a couple hard copies of our books. Um, So you can check those out on Amazon. Um, Just search Navigating Psychedelics. The titles are the uh let's see here navigating psychedelics integration workbook and the navigating psychedelics trip journal so those are things you might want to check out really nice hard copies big format like a workbook um so really great stuff uh so definitely check those out we'd love that support and as always you can support us on patreon patreon.com slash psychedelics today we just got a new donor the other day which is lovely very helpful so thank you all to all our donors and um yeah finally just share your favorite episodes with some friends maybe they'll really like it Uh, especially if they're professionals in mental health space they'll probably learn a whole bunch of stuff they didn't know about before so again thanks for listening and uh, let's jump in so (laughs) s-ketamine this has uh, been covering my news feed for the past week. <laughs> it's almost a little much. Big news. <laughs> but yeah. it is big news, right? So um, long and short, a Johnson & Johnson subsidiary, um, Janssen Pharmaceutica, has worked a derivative of ketamine, S-ketamine. It's really almost a nearly identical molecule. Worked it through the whole FDA, DEA approval process to have a new approved um, prescribable drug that insurance companies will cover. Well, likely will cover. I don't know if we've got word on what insurance companies are doing yet, but it's looking positive. Um, and you know, it's a, it's a big move. Ketamine has been prescribed generically for a long time, uh, to treat depression and other symptoms, um, and indications. So, I don't know what, what are some, some of the first thoughts you had when you started seeing these articles, Kyle? Well, I, I've been chatting with people on and off. Uh, you know, I knew this was coming. So uh, I was chatting with a lot of people. When we were out in Arizona, I got to um, chat with a few uh, ketamine therapists and people that do this stuff. And, you know, there, I guess there's always been a little bit of a worry about, like, how uh, this Jansen is going to come in and create this new... Uh, I, I guess it's really just a process patent, right? They've uh, took the mirror image of ketamine, and that's all really what S-ketamine is, um, <clears throat> the mirror molecule of ketamine, and kind of patent the, the process of that and um, created a quote-unquote new molecule. <laughs> um, and so, you know, from what, like chatting with some people, they were a little bit concerned on how that could start to become, I guess, like, you know, a lot of people would possibly make like generic ketamine, like obsolete. Um, now that this pharmaceutical company is behind this. Um, but so, yeah, when I first saw it, I was like, you know, I, I don't know. It's like a bittersweet thing of like, this is exciting. Um, that, wow, this pharmaceutical company kind of approved, an FDA approved um, like a a psychedelic in a sense. I mean, you know, it's not a traditional psychedelic, but um, it was exciting to see that the FDA passed this new drug for depression treatment. As I started to read it, I was a little bit concerned because uh, some of the reports suggest that like, you know, it has to be in conjunction with an antidepressant. Um, and so it kind of just started raising some alarms in me of like, oh, how are they going to prescribe this? Um, you know, is somebody going to need to be on an antidepressant uh, to, to receive this type of treatment? What's the price going to be? Because the price is going to be way jacked up than generic ketamine since it's so cheap. Um, and so, you know, some of these things kind of started to you know, ring. I'm like, Oh yeah, what's, what's going on here? Is this actually the best thing? Or like, what if, you know, they just continue to do research with generic ketamine, which, you know, I, I guess is off patent and it's so cheap. And if you're a big pharma company, you're not making too much money off of that. Right, right, right. Um, can you give us like a, so you mentioned some pricing to me earlier. 
Can you just kind of like generally mention some of the pricing you saw um, on generic ketamine? Yeah, I just um, I actually just saw something from uh, Raquel Bennett. She just posted from her institute. Uh, generic ketamine, I believe. Let me pull this up really quick. I think it was like a dollar fifty. Um, I'm just going to double check this so I'm not right. And there's going to be major price anything. differences depending on routes of administration. So like inter- intravenous or or IM versus lozenges or nasal. It's going to be a really whole, you know, variability based on that. Yeah. So um, advantages of the generic, um, it costs one dollar and fifty nine cents for a hundred uh, milligrams at retail price. So it's pretty cheap. Dollar fifty nine for a hundred. You're thinking that's IM IV price, not compounded into a lozenge, probably. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm guessing so. Um, because then the next bullet point was it's ninety three percent bioavailable when administered IM. Um. So yeah, I'm guessing they're probably just talking about like IV IM and right, just regular ketamine. <clears throat> so. Here's a quote from a Washington Post article, um, and it's talking about the Janssen Pharmaceutica pricing. Um, the list price of the drug will be $590 to $885 per treatment session based on the dosage taken, which will vary between patients. During the first month of therapy, that would add up to a price in the range of 4720 to $6,785. After the first month, maintenance therapy could range from 2300 to 3500 So, you know, not a direct quote. I kind of rounded numbers a little bit while speaking, but, you know, that's a pretty good um, sense of the pricing difference there. So ketamine should be cheap. Um, it's like putting a new patent, like reversing the uh, molecule of ibuprofen and... <laughs> charging, you know, a thousand times more money for it. So something to be aware of. So yeah, was, it, was there anything that came up to you when you started seeing uh, those headlines hit Facebook and social media? I was just getting really confused. I'm like, I don't understand this business move from like a money capitalism perspective. It just didn't seem logical. And then some folks started suggesting that it was kind of more of a long play to you know, dominate this space by um, putting out kind of hit articles um, against ketamine, suggesting ketamine was dangerous, even though this is pretty much the same molecule. Um, you know, reversing the molecule doesn't really do too much, right? So, um, you know, we don't know that with the utmost certainty, but I think largely based on clinical data and safety data, we know that this stuff's wildly safe unless used in a reckless recreational fashion to excess right. over time. Mm-hmm. Um, so let me actually read this thing here uh, from Dr. Scott Shannon from the, uh, what's his place called? The Wholeness Center. Wholeness Center. Yeah, yeah. founder of the Wholeness Center. Um, really, really uh, wonderful guy. Assistant clinical professor of the Department of Psychology at the University of Colorado. And I believe he's driving the um, phase three trials, or at least in a somewhat leadership position in the phase three trials for MDMA assisted psychotherapy in Fort Collins, Colorado. So here's the quote um, from Scott Shannon. Uh, Spravato, Spravato is kind of the trade name they're putting on as ketamine. Spravato is mostly bravado. Ketamine, like many medications, is composed of two chemical forms, the left and right-handed forms. Janssen's new rele- newly released medicine, Spravato, Asketamine is simply one half of the original medicine that was released in the U.S. in 1970. The science about its antidepressant effects is also not new. Data about the parent molecule has been well known to psychiatry since Zarate's study published in 2006. In the last few years, many clinics like ours have begun to offer treatment with ketamine for severely depressed patients as an off-label generic medicine. Ketamine is unique that it works quickly for depression and is quite safe. I have worked with all forms of ketamine, IM, IV, nasal spray, and sublingual lozenges. 
What I know from my work is that IV and IM forms of ketamine are quite powerful and often amazingly fast. The treatments boost mood and pop someone out of a a depressed state that may have held them hostage for decades, often failing a dozen or more conventional psychiatric medications. My experience is that the dissociation and the dramatically altered state of consciousness that goes with it offers a new perspective on one's life and suffering. At least one study documents that the more profound the dissociation, the more profound the antidepressant effects. Lozenges and sprays offer a mild, a milder and less dramatic experience and a less powerful antidepressant effect. They do help, but the effect is much reduced. Janssen decided to maximize profit by patenting a spray for outpatient use, but the effectiveness is not so maximal. It should come as no surprise that the research data submitted to the FDA by the sponsor Janssen for Spravato is actually much less impressive than plain old generic ketamine. Only two of five phase three studies demonstrated effectiveness. Oh, that's fascinating. (laughs) You only need two positive studies, no matter how many negative. Mm. The price will be astronomic. The first month of treatment will cost roughly 4,700 to 6,700. I routinely order compounded ketamine nasal spray for my patients for about $60 a month. Surprise, generic ketamine is dirt cheap. The cost for six sessions of IV ketamine is typically less than $3,000 total. And this option packs much more antidepressant punch than Spravato. Spravato is the first new antidepressant modality approved by the FDA since Prozac 30 years ago. It should come as no surprise that this that it is neither new nor particularly a good idea, I will stick with the tried and true generic ketamine. And that, again, is from Dr. Scott Shannon from the Holness Center in Fort Collins. So, a lot there. Um, yeah. <laughs> and it's, it's a really interesting thing. I don't know. Any, any um, comments on that? Yeah, it's... Um... It, yeah, I, I don't know. It, it's such an interesting move on uh, Jansen's part, like why they would pick up ketamine and kind of redo it in this nasal spray when, uh, yeah, it's it's been be- being used off-label with, uh, I guess, some pretty decent results. I guess I wonder if their move was to kind of just want to be a player and be able to, to profit a little bit off of it. Um yeah, and the, the expense is just pretty crazy <laughs> thinking about it. But then again, I don't know. There are some IV um, ketamine places that are kind of pricey, right? Like I've definitely seen IV ketamine anywhere from like $500 to $1,000 for infusions, right? Um, yeah. yeah. But I guess that's, that's the price range. much, yeah, probably much lower than um, what this S-ketamine nasal spray is going to be. Right, because you're looking at the drug from anywhere from like 550 to $600 per dose. Um, and you're going to get less effect through nasal versus IVIM, um, theoretically, according to, well, I don't know about theoretically. This is what Scott's reporting to us based on his data. Um, yeah. And I remember when we were chatting with Scott too, um, <clears throat> on the podcast, you know, we had a, a, a lengthy discussion about the transpersonal effect of ketamine. Um, and it sounds like, you know, he's pointing it out in this little blurb as well that he sent over to us about the um, dissociation effect on how that's actually impacting somebody's depression or like the anti-depressant uh, effect. And, you know, I think coming from our transpersonal framework, I think there is some healing potential in there. And uh, is this medication... Um, with the nasal spray, is it going to produce similar effects? Um, and yeah, I don't know. It's interesting because I, I was reading that, uh, you know, the nasal spray might not necessarily produce a lot of the dissociation effects mm-hmm. of regular ketamine. Mm-hmm. Um, but I don't know. Maybe that's up for debate. I've read um, mixed opinions about it. That it, it's still there. Some argue that you know it's it's not going to be possibly as strong as um, the generic. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. So. Here's another comment from Scott's business partner, or at least um, another doctor at the Wholeness Center, Dr. Craig Heacock, um, quote, I agree. I suspect we'll see roughly and equal and minimal efficacy because between the 
gazillion dollar nasal spray and the very inexpensive lozenges. While IV IM treatments will continue to be rapidly life-changing for many patients, particularly those with bipolar spectrum depression. So yeah, that's really interesting. I, I kind of forgot about the bipolar um, depression um, application. That's really uh, good to re- remember. Mm-hmm. Um, so yeah, just kind of another clinical person's opinion. I, I think a lot of clinical folks are really kind of um, a little upset about this because it's so much research dollars went into it, but you know, it's the medical system is really financially incentivized. Like we have to have a patentable thing to see big money. People want to throw down millions of dollars to get it through the trials. Um, Mm -hmm. And it's really unfortunate. We'd see a lot more drugs on the market if we could have kind of like a, you read that other, the blog post that was getting retweeted a lot um, on, uh, it was kind of the first um, critique of esketamine uh, of the hype. Um, by this doctor, um, I thought you retweeted at one point, but the guy was pretty much saying he wants to see some sort of panel set up where FDA regulators can say, okay, this drug has been used for a long time. Let's perhaps s- just agree based on data and historical experience that it's okay to be prescribed. It's like an approved medication for these indications. Mm. So, um, I think that would be a real game changer for for a lot of drugs like it's okay Mm -hmm. to (laughs) prescribe ketamine for this and therefore insurance companies will feel safe prescribing it um, or allowing their physicians to prescribe it and one interesting thing that was in there was you know we're thinking about health insurance i'm also thinking there's there's a big aspect of malpractice insurance doctors Mm. um, risk their insurance coverage malpractice insurance coverage when getting in here because the insurance companies don't necessarily want them to be doing this because they, you know, they want to limit their exposure. They only want to cover a certain amount of things. And until U S regulators say it's okay, they're going to back off. And that was the two major things I got from that article. Right. Mm. Hmm. Yeah. The uh, insurance thing you know, that also brings up an interesting point that, you know, insurance might cover um, esketamine versus like generic. I don't think I've heard too many ketamine sessions being covered by insurance, but I could be wrong. Um, And I wonder if um, insurance would pay, like uh, pay for like lozenges and stuff like that. Not, not too sure. Right. So I think, um, to go back to the lozenge versus IVIM thing, I think what we see is, yes, decreased efficacy versus IVIM with, uh, with lozenges, but um, you know some physicians will let you take them home. And perhaps the, the whole picture is that you are able to um, you know, get your massive intervention through IV or IM, and then you're able to maintain with lozenges for a while, maybe once a week or whatever it is. Um, and that way you don't need the more expensive intervention all the time. Right. And that that's actually a critique that I heard from a few people about um, S-ketamine was that, you know, you have to go there and you'll only have to be able to use S-ketamine at the medical center um, versus like, you know, with the lozenges, you get them prescribed, take them home, bring them to a therapist and do psychotherapy mm-hmm. with it. Um and it's yeah it'd be a lot cheaper to do that than go to the office get get a nasal spray and just kind of hang out there for two hours um and i also wonder you know i know there's a lot of places that don't do the therapy aspect but yeah i wonder if that would be tied up into that at all um versus okay you go in get iv im and then you know uh get prescribed ketamine lozenges, take them home, bring them to a therapist, um, and kind of have these more psychotherapy sessions with people, um, for a lot cheaper, maybe. Mm, Absolutely. Right. It's a, you know, total cost of treatment is a really big deal. We have to consider that it's, um, you know, often like you don't get to a quote unquote fixed place with any drug. 
Um, you know, even with MDMA therapy, we don't know if it's going to, based on the data, we don't know if, if the effect is going to last more than a year as of right now, um, that, you know, we should <laughs> see that. And we, we imagine it will be the case, but we don't have firm data on that yet. Um, and yeah. it's, it's going that's also going to be fairly expensive though. I think people are going to be a little bit more compassionate and make money off of the service, not necessarily off the drug. Right. Um, so here's another quote. Let's see. Oh, come on. <laughs> this is actually a big one. <laughs> um, yeah, we only asked for a few sentences from folks, but people got really excited, which is okay. I'm, I'm good with it. <laughs> so this is from Jessica Katzman. I think, do you offhand know if she's a PsyD? Um, yeah, she's a PsyD out okay. in the, um, the Bay Area. Right. Um, great friend of the show. So hi, Jessica. So here we go. From Jessica Katzman, the approval of esketamine by the FDA is highly controversial in the community of current ketamine providers for several reasons. Uh, I'll kind of just list the reasons first, then we'll start at the top. Routes of administration, cost, and functional differences. So esketamine is delivered as a nasal spray. Well, most of us in the therapeutic ketamine community work with IV, IM, and sublingual. A potential complication of nasal administrations is that the bioavailability how much of the drug gets absorbed is widely variable with some estimates between eight to 50% versus a hundred percent, 93% IM and 30% sublingual. This range can be, can make targeted dosing strategies challenging. That's really interesting. However, delivering this drug as a simple nasal spray may reduce medical equipment and monitoring needs as do sublingual lozenges cost. The high prices, or actually before we do that, routes of administration, that's really interesting stuff there. So actually losing a lot of the drug when yeah. as it's administered is really interesting. Um, I don't know. So I'm not too concerned about quote unquote losing specific quantities of the drug, but this is similar to the Bufo toad 5-MeO DMT thing where yes, you're smoking X milligrams of toad secretion, but because toads produce at unpredictable levels and we don't all have, you know, basement laboratory equipment to tell what the concentration is, we're going to get a huge amount of variability and we don't really want that in medicine. So right. it's the same thing here with the nasal, um, eight to 50% is really wild. Um, that is when I first read that, I was like, Whoa, as low as 8%. That's, that's really crazy. Cause I always heard, um, you know, the way that they, they described it in a lot of articles that it actually has a more rapid onset, you know, goes directly into the bloodstream and stuff like that. Um, and I would expect, I wouldn't, yeah, I guess I wouldn't expect that huge var variability right there from eight to 50%, but right. It's, it's really interesting. I, um, so that, that, that's definitely something people need to stay on top of. Um, it's a huge thing to consider. Um, doctors need to be aware of that. I'm sure they are. Uh, and they will continue to be made aware of it by the existing um, community academy and facilitators or administrators. So now cost, and you know, we already talked, this, talked about this a bunch, um, high prices um, being quoted in the media are apparently wholesale, which does not include pharmacy markup or administration fees it would be entirely dependent on a patient's plan to determine if the medicine is covered so okay blue cross versus you know um, kaiser you could get covered on one and not the other um or have to pay a whole bunch extra for the drug uh so for example blue cross blue shield just released a statement that esketamine is currently under clinical review and will be considered experimental until they make a determination if it should be covered um under their medical benefits that's really weird um, Jessica says, I want to emphasize that it was never the medicine itself that led to higher costs of treatment as generic ketamine is incredibly cheap. Yep. What patients pay for is the provider's time for hours spent with a co-therapy team, such as in our practice. That's cool. And facility costs like nursing, staff, medical equipment, etc. cetera. Um, if the medicine is covered by insurance, um, 
as an FDA approved treatment for medical health concerns. It does not mean that providers and facility costs will be paid. Um, we don't know that. Um, it remains to be seen how this might look in, in their particular practice at Jessica's place. So that's really, really interesting. Number of things there that are really important. Um, we are paying for someone's time. So I think in the U S a therapist's time is generally considered 150 an hour bill rate. Um, so if you're billing for insurance, I think that's what insurance uh, is going to pay the provider or the, yeah, the individual provider. So, you know, run those numbers 150 times four. It's, it's not cheap. That's probably where you get the $600. Um, assuming ketamine's a dollar (laughs) fifty but you need you know you need the iv stuff the needle the um, bags or the syringes or whatever however you're administering it right that's Mm -hmm. a big difference there um and you know at at jessica katzen's place it looks like they're doing co-therapy so potentially two therapists at the same time um to Mm. make that maps model which which could really improve the safety the level of safety people feel uh, which yeah. safety in a lot of cases equals healing in the mental health space. Um, cool. So anything you want to jump into on, on her lines on cost there? No, I think we kind of um, talked a lot about the cost. <laughs> and functional differences. Yeah, this is, again, a little repetitive perhaps, but um, Jessica says, this is also an area where we lack clarity. S-ketamine is just the left-handed half of the ketamine me- molecule. This allows Janssen Pharmaceutica to run clinical trials seeking a patent and FDA approval, whereas no company was willing to spend the money testing generic off-patent ketamine despite years of successful clinical applications and smaller scale studies. There have been some mixed results about the true efficacy of S-ketamine. There is a proposal for a study that compares S-ketamine with generic ketamine happening in Japan, which is excellent news. Thank you, Japan. So we also anticipate those results. Without that research, it is hard to reliably say what the functional differences might be. As for whether this medicine could also be a valuable adjunct to psychotherapy, that is also still an unknown, as few of us have worked with it in any capacity. You know, that's that's safe science speak, right? Like, we assume it's almost identical to ketamine. Um, that's me. That's my assumption. I, I'm willing to not be a, <laughs> I'm willing to you know actually this is a good tangent for a second pulling a Lenny here um, I purchased the a function of reason after hearing you talk about it and I'm kind of like falling yeah, yeah. in love with Whitehead all over again and he had this line about um, obscurantism or something like that where there's this thing in the scientific world and most of the Western world now, cause we're so kind of science dominated that we're not really willing to speculate beyond what the data says. Um, we're not. <laughs> and you know, I, I think there's a functional reason to do that. You know, we should have the freedom to say that. And you know, if you're a scientist out there doing research, feel free. Like you have to, you know, I think we have to do that, but we can qualify our statements. It's not that our statements are meaningless. It's that, you know, human reason suggests that this might be the way the thing might go. Um, there is a really good uh, quote from that <clears throat> about science and um, uh, research and stuff like that. I'll see if I can pull it up. But I remember when I was listening to that audio book, that part really stood out. Um, even if the facts are there and we're in our little bubble, we still won't accept it. Um, I mean, that's just kind of a paraphrase of um, what I remember, but it was really fascinating. But I'll try and look for it, and if I stumble across it, um, I'll read it. <laughs> it's amazing. This is a series of lectures delivered at Princeton in the early 1900s. Um, I assume, well, who knows what the year was, but we'll, we'll put a link to the audiobook in the, um, in the blog post, so check it out. It's pretty cheap, less than $10 for the audiobook. All right, so let me find where I was here. Uh, <laughs> so, um, in general, many in the community have a optimistic view of the larger picture as FDA approval for the use of a ketamine product for mental health diagnosis brings this treatment back into the realm of psychiatry, legitimizes our work, and potentially makes it more broadly accessible to more people. 
And there is some hope that insurance plans might perform a cost analysis and conclude that it is way more cost effective and equally clinically beneficial, if not better, ben- if not more beneficial, um, to cover generic ketamine. All the challenges mentioned above speak to the nature of our fragmented and profit driven healthcare and medical research system than anything else. Um, so that's, you know, pretty great. I, I really appreciate it that feedback. And I think there's, there's some real value there. Um, it's a, it's a really interesting problem. And, you know, I, a lot of us kind of speculated that the issues coming out of the compass psilocybin thing was that compass was just going to put the, put the clamps on psilocybin and nobody else could use psilocybin, um, because they had the only, uh, theoretically they had the only access to GMP psilocybin, which um, according to my conversation with Brad Birch, isn't necessarily true. Um, they could, others could come up with their own methods of manufacturing psilocybin. Um, it's kind of like a time and creativity problem. Uh, as long as it's GMP, it should be fine, right? It's like almost identical end result, though um, the process is really the trick. So, yeah. right, with ketamine, it's, you know, this is a, this is a drug. It's... Um, a thing that people do want to profit from people, you know, I, the conversation about profit from medicine is tricky, right? Like doctors need to make money so they can pay their medical bills. Like we're not going to medical school or becoming therapists for free. Oftentimes we're leveraging our life 20 years into the future to get a degree that allows us to do this work because we care. Um, not me. I did an undergrad of philosophy. I didn't, I didn't go for it. Um, I just didn't like the idea of, that, you know, going into that debt, but other people are willing to, you know, do eight years plus of education to become doctors or whatever else. And they have to be compensated for that time. Otherwise they go bankrupt. And, you know, in the olden days, they would go to jail if they went bankrupt. I don't, I don't know if they do that anymore. (laughs) (laughs) Um, Debtor's prison. Um, But yeah, it's, it's a big deal. Like, how do we, how do we be compassionate with our pricing? How do we um, you know, kind of push back on our drug providers like Janssen or Compass or whatever to say, hey, like that's great that you have this patent, but this is what this is what we're looking for. We don't really like that. Um, and you know, I think we've done that with Compass because Compass has overflow into our psychedelic world. Janssen doesn't necessarily have much um, overflow into our world, as far as we know. Um, as a subsidiary of Johnson and Johnson, they're like hyper corporate, so you know, it's probably a little tricky. Um, and S ketamine to a point of clarity, S ketamine has been around for a long time. Um, this is not a new drug. This is a drug that's still patented by Janssen. Um, and let me see if I can pull up the date. 1997, it was introduced for medical use. So it's been around for, shit, is, hmm. that, is that almost 20? It is yeah. really 20, over 20 years. Shit. So yeah, 22. Yeah. So something to be considered. Well, like we see the headlines, we go, oh, cool, a new drug. It's like, no, it's a new application for a new drug. So they didn't, like they had the leverage on all their existing safety data and they could just kind of move it through. Um, and they have great partnerships with the DEA, FDA, so they could just like cruise. So that's the thing that big pharma can do that a lot of these smaller organizations like MAPS can't do necessarily. You know, it took MAPS a long time to get to where they're at. Um, with MDMA and, and the feds. So to be considered. Yeah. Um, trying to think, is there anything else we want to jump into on the ketamine topic? I kind of feel like we beat it to death, but maybe there's some. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I don't know. Uh, did you want to read Dr. Matt Brown's statement too that he sent over? So could you Could you read that one? Yeah, sure. <clears throat> Um, physicians have been able to prescribe ketamine for decades. It's one of the few medications with a very large uh, safety profile and is even FDA approved as a, uh, anesthesia agent, anesthetic agent for children. Um, since the 1990s, uh, practitioners have started to use this medication off label to treat treatment, uh, resistant depression. There's been little interest from any company in seeking FDA approval uh, for this use as a racemic ketamine. 
uh, a chemical that contains both the left-handed and right-handed version of the molecule uh, has been off patent for some time, and there would be no money to be earned from this effort. Uh, Janssen Pharmaceuticals has just completed trials on esketamine um, and has granted FDA approval for the use of acute depression. Uh, despite it being one half of the normal mixture uh, of what's called ketamine, it's recognized as a new drug. As such, Janssen has the ability to price it as such. Uh, while we do not have the clarity on the cost of the new medications, reported that it will be roughly 100 times uh, typical cost of ketamine. Uh, this is all very new and things may change, but currently it looks like the FDA might just uh, have approved a product that will be very expensive and possibly not as effective as something um, with a strong safety profile that's already out there, which uh, remains a challenge to use in practice. Um, so, yeah, I think, you know, saying a lot of the same things Jessica and Scott have, or Dr. Shannon, Dr. Katzman have mentioned. Um, and it seems like that is, yeah, just some of the concerns, how effective is it and the price? Um, and I don't know, is it too early to really tell, um, like how this is all going to shape out? I possibly, I mean, they just approved it. It hasn't hit the market yet. Um, we don't know how it's going to really work. Mm -hmm. So I don't know. Right. Um, I'm wondering if you could, just to flesh out the picture around ketamine, so you've been in the room when ketamine's been administered by, by physicians, can you like talk about what it looks like generally? Um, I think you've mostly seen sublingual lozenges, right? Yeah. Um, I mean, honestly, couldn't really tell too much. I mean, the way that it was set up, it was set up like a psychedelic therapy session, right? So eye shades and music. Um, and, you know, similar type of themes, people bringing up uh, visions or memories, uh, but the focus was to refocus them internally um, and to kind of pay attention to what was going on inside. So very similar to, you know, what a, a psychedelic therapy session would possibly look like or a breathwork session, <clears throat> I guess you could say. Um but, you know, it, it definitely had a little bit more of like a sedating effect and relaxing effect, you know. Mm. So it didn't look like... Um, so I know internally the experience can be, you know, wildly variable. But um, tryptamines, are, I think, are a little more, you know, you can kind of sense it a little bit more. Ketamine, kind of like the dissociative effect makes your psyche go a little bit away from the body, right? So like, yeah. as you come back to the body, perhaps the terror that you could have experienced kind of like chills out and you're like mm -hmm. relieved as you're coming back too. So, you know, the, the facilitator's experience of what the sitter or the experiencers have going through could be really variable. Um, but yeah, the, the fact that it's not like, you know, supercharging the psyche, like, you know, doing the, the LSD thing or the mushroom thing. Uh, makes right yeah there's a, i mean there wasn't as much energy right i mean there could be a lot of energy with somebody on uh, some of the tryptamines um you know maybe really powerful visions coming in i mean this is a, uh, a much more i mean i don't know what the person is going through i mean you know, i could ask them but um i can't tell that like tell what what their experience was um but it looked a little bit uh, more relaxing in the sense like wasn't as activating as like say psilocybin would be right 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 because i mean yeah it's a dissociative and kind of like an anesthetic so it is you know you're kind of dissociating away from everything um or at least your body right versus like tryptamines i mean you can get really in touch with your body in different ways and feel things and want to move more and um maybe laugh a little bit more and be a little bit more animated yeah totally so i think that was probably the main difference um less animation right 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 um i've not had an experience with ketamine yet have you no not yet um <laughs> it's interesting it feels like it's forward, looming looking forward to it <laughs> <laughs> like i um i just feel like it's almost inevitable for me in the next year 
to to have some sort of therapeutic ketamine experience so um not that i'm necessarily like shopping for it it's just so available now that it's like oh you just ask and um <laughs> you're, you're pretty much good to go like i don't know right, of any me, indications like contraindications to you mm, not that i can think of off the top of my head right now just in case but go ahead um yeah for me it's just um trying to find somebody to work with and finding the time right you know other other than that um i'm very curious i think i think i'll be able to really kind of uh get my get a session in once like i finish up everything and have a little bit more time on my hand right um so htn so contraindications htn hypertension um hypertension to drug class compounds and stroke and intracranial mass or hemorrhage so if you're hemorrhaging in the brain or um, have a mass in your brain you know perhaps a tumor um uh, brain tumor Perhaps that's not what you want to do. And um, there's a whole bunch of cautions like pregnancy, head trauma, um, ICP, IOP, CAD. These are a lot of acronyms. I'm not a doctor, so I don't know them all. CAD, CHF, th thyrotoxosis, psychosis, <laughs> um, caution of psychosis. So hepatic impairment, acute alcoholism. If chronic alcohol use, caution of substance abuse. So, yeah, like if you have an addiction issue, perhaps ketamine is not the right move. Um, it's pretty available in the underground. So, like, you know, we have to consider that even after you get it in a therapeutic setting, if you really, really liked it, you could keep going after it as like a, a drug of abuse, quote unquote. Right, and isn't that the one concern with ketamine in general is the potential risk of use there versus right. like very very low risk of use for um, psilocybin, LSD. I mean, I guess the risk of use there for MDMA is a thing, but as you always say, and Ann Shulkin says, just kind of stops working after <laughs> after a while. Well, but, we get um, issues all the time, right? Like it, risks of abuse is tricky. Like we, we want to think psychedelics are like, risk-free in a sense or, or at least abuse potential free but being in colorado like i see so much psychedelic abuse and overuse um and like we even know psychiatrists who are way overusing mdma um and we got an email last night from a person who started using mushrooms weekly and you know oh, yeah. worked himself into a kind of persistent nervous or you know i don't know what the right word is neurotic state um, and is kind of concerned because he's got a family history of mental illness. So it's tricky. How do we, how do we talk, speak truthfully or like get closer to truth with a lot of this stuff? It's really complicated. Um, cause a lot of us are kind of like enthusiastic about this stuff and you know, we, we, we just want to be realistic about the risk and harms. Like, um, I listened to this podcast with Tim Ferriss and, uh, what's this dude's name? Dr. Peter Atia, A-T-T-I-A who's a genius. I, I love that guy, but they had this whole conversation on drugs that I, or psychedelics in particular that I really think they needed to have a better expert in the room on. Um, mm. it was really kind of unfortunate. Like I really appreciate Tim's work. I really appreciate Atia's work, but it's like, you know, come on guys. Like you, <laughs> you're talking to millions of people right now. And by what were they saying? So, they were they were kind of doing a run through on psychedelic therapies and like the possibilities of the future, like their talk on ibogaine, like was kind of my perspective a year ago on ibogaine. Like I I do think ibogaine substantially safer. Um, MDMA, they were saying stuff like, I would bet against MDMA being therapeutic outside of a carefully controlled environment. Where I'm like, I don't know. I don't know that that's true. We don't have any data to suggest that. You know, that's why they were kind of like, they were couching it in terms of a bet. So I'm like, mm. uh, you know, you go to a fish show with 20 of your best <laughs> friends. Um, odds are good you're going to have an amazing time, assuming you don't go way overboard. Um, and perhaps you're smiling for the next three months. Um, right. I know from personal experience, my heart's really softened as a result of a lot of this stuff. And um, I think there is a lot of therapy there. Um, you know, I'm certainly not drinking anywhere close to the amount I was 10 years ago. I'll put it mm. that, couch it in those terms, like drink, <laughs> you know, not that I don't drink, but m the level and degree to which I was drinking is way, way different. You right. Know, far less harmful. 
Yeah, and I think, um, I don't know, with some of the recreational experiences, like, I mean, I, I've talked about it before in the past, like, that's what got me interested in this and the some of those experiences being naive and not really knowing what the hell I was doing. I would call that a recreational experience. I mean, they, the, those are some of the most therapeutic, beneficial experiences of my life. Um, you know, I didn't, I didn't have the whole therapeutic framework in my mind back then. Um, but yeah, I mean, it was super helpful. Right. And, you know, there's a whole spectrum of party recreational scenarios too, right? There's the keg party at a frat house. There's, you know, a rave. There's going out to a bar. Um, there's going to Spongle and then there's going to uh, Elton John or something or like a Smash Mouth concert. Like, <laughs> are you... Is it really going to be that amazing at Smash Mouth that you want to do that? Like, you know, if you love Smash Mouth, cool. But you know, consider context or Dave Matthews even with like a lot of really. So there's a lot of kind of like insider recreational stuff here. Unfortunately, like the Dave Matthews scene is just notorious for like how many beers can I chug before I even get inside, and like how right. drunk, how like totally demolished can I be, um, and then drugs on top of that in a lot of cases. So it's like what what's going on there is that is that really the right environment to like look for some sort of like relaxing chill thing or is it like a private party you guys you you and your friends put on somewhere like uh um you know maybe you do a full moon party with your friends and it's kind of like let's let's have like a really good time and, and play by a certain set of rules don't be don't be a dick stuff like that and you know perhaps that is the right scenario you know this is all speculation this is not medical yeah and this is no yeah. there's no science here right so you know, consider that for what it's worth. Um, and there was a number of other things that I kind of disagreed with them on, but for the most part, they did okay. Tim's drug policy comments. I was like, come on, dude, you need to talk some more drug policy people. <laughs> like you're, you're clearly only talking to researchers. Um, but you know, overall I appreciate him and he's done volunteer work at Zendo cause he had to go to Zendo. So he really wanted to give back and, mm. <laughs> um, yeah. So anyway, I, I think we kind of beat the ketamine topic to death. Um, I hope people appreciate it <laughs> and um, learn something. There's a, there's a lot here, and this is still new stuff. Um, yeah, it's so new, and I think it's going to take a while to really understand and tear apart. But at least, you know, we had got some opinions from people in the field um, to just help us better understand the landscape as well. And, you know, I hope presenting it to you guys um, – to everybody, you know, it was beneficial to just listen to. Um, cause it is, I, you know, I keep seeing all these articles come out and reading everything. It's just like, Whoa, there's so many mixed little opinions going on. And, um, a lot of, a lot of information to kind of tear apart and, and, and try to really figure out what the hell's going on here. <laughs> <laughs> and yeah, time, time is, it's going to take some time to figure out how it all unfolds and plays out. Right. Um, so I had an interesting idea. We've not done this before, but I think it could be fun. Um, I got a really, we got a really interesting call um, from somebody yesterday on our Google number. It was pretty oh much somebody God, saying, yeah. hey, I, I bought all these spores to grow mushrooms, but they didn't work. Help. How can I grow mushrooms? I'm like, well, you know, <laughs> calling somebody for help is a really interesting move. Um, but, you know, thanks for doing that. Um, but anyway, I, I thought it was kind of comical and I was like, you know, what if we played it, stuff like that on the podcast? So, you know, here's a phone number. If you want to call us and leave messages, um, that we can maybe play on the podcast, feel free. Um, it's a Google voice number. The number is 970-368-3133. I may regret this, but I think it could <laughs> be really fun. Um, so if you have comments, you want to like share on the show, we can do it anonymously or with your name. You know, feel free. Just leave the message there. Maybe we can splice it in at the end of the show. Um, I think that could be really cool. So again, 970-368-3133. Yikes. <laughs> I like it. Cool. <laughs> we'll see what happens. <laughs> yeah, right. So um, it could be a great way to answer questions. So again, yeah. um, I guess let's sign off here. Uh, if you want to support the show, you can leave us a small monthly donation at patreon.com slash psychedelics today. We've got all sorts of rewards up there and uh, if you want to check out our shop we've got digital copies of our book there psychedelics today shop.com and um digital copies of books shirts shower curtains um some other funny stuff and 
Um, I actually just got recognized in uh, one of our shirts the other day at a, at a concert, which is really cool. So maybe you can also get recognized with that spore print logo. Um, and yeah, we've also got coaching and uh, available from our website. You can, you can book us an hour at a time or a bundle as well. If you want to like jump into a series of coaching calls with us, um, and we've got online ed navigating psychedelics. It's an amazing class, uh, hundred percent money back guarantee. Um, no questions asked. We'll just refund you if you don't like it. So check it out. Um, psychedelicstoday.com for that one. It's really extensive. I, I think it's the most complete online ed available in the psychedelic space right now, especially in one package. Um, I saw some other people pop up some courses recently. They're only like four, three to five hours long total, and they are charging almost as much as we are. And we've got like a gazillion, well, 12 master classes uh, from like 30 minutes to an hour each from various folks in the psychedelic space. So I think it's probably the best thing going. And if you... A bunch of extras too. Oh, yeah. And uh, yeah, you get the uh, trip journal and integration workbook PDF download. So, um, you know, it comes with all of our material, lectures, master classes, and a bunch of extras as well. So it's a pretty complete package. It's the course that we wish we had. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. So if you're if you're looking at becoming a professional in this space, um, this is a great way to dip your toes in the water and get a relatively well-rounded out picture of what's going on um, with these various compounds and the various traditional and uh, upcoming methods to work with this stuff. Um, so check it out. Again, Navigating Psychedelics, just Google that or go to our site, psychedelicstudy.com. You'll find links for it there. And uh, we've got a bunch of free classes online as well. So I guess that's it. <laughs> So signing off from Psychedelics today, this is Joe Moore and Kyle Buller. Take care, everybody. Thanks so much. Bye-bye.